Um, hello, everyone. Um, certainly a privilege today to be presenting to so many global colleagues. Um, I'm zooming in today from Melbourne, Australia, which enjoys the reputation at the moment as being the planet's most locked down city. So in my presentation today, I'd like to take you beyond research laboratories, field trials and predictive modelling. Today, I'd like just to switch our perspective a little bit. Some might say a perspective from another world. So please bear with me while I take you on this journey. The global food system has become so complex. We used to talk about supply chains and value chains as linear. Nowadays, they appear more like webs of intricate interdependencies. As one of the world's wealthy consumers, I can get most foods delivered to my door, regardless of season and at the tap of my smartphone. But we're dealing with climatic events, climate change, a global pandemic, geopolitical differences. These are constant disruptors and there are more that we have to deal with. We're also now challenged by the needs of the consumers, the baby boomers and Gen X, as well as the traditional additional drivers for the millennials, Gen Y and Gen Next. And who knows what the growing expectations from Gen Z, iGen and Gen Alpha might be. And so we are dealing in this food world of instantaneous access to everything within a continuing culture of social and technological disruption. We have crowdsourced farming. Consumers will buy in food if they can be assured of its authenticity and that they can also trust the producer and people who work along the value chain. The growing fad or what used to be a fad of alternative protein sources has moved on from there. It's no longer a fad. Food has become the new fashion. We see this with the rise of consumer interest in cooking shows on TV. In addition, food is becoming one of the most significant social, economic and environmental connectors. Adding to this complexity is the fact that farmers and producers have to be technology adopters, data collectors and data analysts. The mantra, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it, has created a tsunami of data. As one of my esteemed colleagues, Professor David Lamb, our chief scientist at Food Agility says, data, data everywhere, but does it make us think? We're drowning in the stuff. So sometimes when we're doing that, when we can't see, see the wood for the trees, it does often help to, set, to step back, way back. Taking you into the new world, if Jeff Bezos can do it, so can I, and why can't we? I would like you all today to think about the challenge of building a farm on Mars. Now, at first, you may argue, this seems like an out there proposition for our lifetime. But I was recently talking with Phil Ruthen, founder and director of Ibis World, who has been commenting and do, doing research that civilian space tourism is a present day reality. And we've seen that recently. And to do this into the future will require infrastructure. Coupled with that, in Australia, we also have another cooperative research centre, as have many other places around the world, developing autonomous vehicles for exploration and operation on other planets. So if we think about how far we've advanced in the past 30 years, my presentation today could, but I would argue most likely will, be reality by 2050. But my purpose today isn't to think about every logistic and scientific hurdle, but to try and work how we might create and are already starting to create this reality. My point is this, if there is a blank sheet of paper before us and we get to create a food production system from scratch, where should we start? What would be the most critical elements to establishing an efficient, safe and sustainable food system and what is already happening to bring this disruption to reality. 
Establishing a food production system on Mars would require absolute efficiency. Every molecule of water, every molecule of oxygen, every photon of light, every road or space mile. In the harshest of environments, we will only succeed by maximizing the use of every available resource. And we won't make the same mistakes as we have here on Earth, will we? Of course not. We will establish a food production system that is sustainable, that replenishes the natural environment and minimizes waste. And at the end of each production cycle, we want the land to be ready for the next cycle to be totally replenished. And please remember one of the most critical elements of all, food safety. This is the food that is going to sustain our children, our children's children, and all future generations beyond Gen Alpha and Beta. So what are we going to do to make sure that the food we put in their mouths doesn't harm them? But having set the scene, let's clear away some of this noise and focus on the four key things that I believe are critical to establishing a safe and sustainable food system on our future Mars. The four key things which we must get right are on-farm optimization, scientific infrastructure, we must share farm data, and of course, food safety. Producing food on Mars will require absolute efficiency with each of these elements. I'm now going to take you through some of the work happening in Australia right now in these four key areas using data and technology as examples of what we can replicate and expand upon. I'd argue that when we talk about on-farm optimization, we need to think of every farm on this earth as its own version of Mars. We have every climatic and resource experience occurring right now to mirror conditions on Mars. Low carbon levels, low rainfall, potential high contamination, and land expense, certainly in Australia. Every farm works with its own unique set of resources and constraints. There is no one magic formula to optimization. We need to give farmers the tools and the knowledge to maximize every available resource in a way that is sustainable long-term. This is why on-farm experimentation is critical. One example is the Cool Soil Initiative. It's a great example of how we can support farmers to experiment on farm and maximize their use of resources. The Cool Soil Initiative is a project between Food Agility, Mars Pet Care, Kellogg's, the Manildra Group, Allied Pinnacle, the Sustainable Food Lab, and Charles Sturt University in New South Wales. Scientists are working closely with around 100 broadacre farmers to test and validate management practices that mitigate greenhouse gas emissions, while at the same time enhancing sustainability, productivity and profitability. They measure soil carbon, they conduct spectral assessments of plant growth and capture yield data. These tests are analysed by scientists with farmers. Farmers can also test different approaches in demonstrator fields and results are shared across all farming communities. We're already seeing fantastic results in how farmers can adjust nitrogen efficiencies to avoid emissions without sacrificing their yields. We've also identified more opportunities to increase soil organic carbon than we'd originally thought. And we're seeing trends linking soil organic carbon to tighter yield and better nitrogen use efficiency. The economic lens is so very important here. This is Catherine Marriott. She is a beef farmer, the CEO of the Riverine Plains Farming Systems Group and an active participant in the Cool Soil Initiative. Her statement really hits home. There's no point making changes if you're going to go broke making them. And you can't be green if you're in the red. Catherine is deeply involved in the Cool Soil Initiative. This farmer-led 
and corporate driven initiative means farmers decide how they will approach emission reduction in the context of their own businesses and resource constraints. Multinationals like Kellogg's and Mars and processors like Manildra and Allied Pinnacle help drive change through the whole value chain. All of this is backed up by validated scientific frameworks that evolve as the data pool grows. So on the one hand, we have consistent metrics that can be used on a global scale to validate emission reduction targets. And on the other hand, data and management that is tailored enough to drive practice change on farm and even at paddock level. The Cool Soil Initiative aims to cover 50% of grain production in Australia by 2023, as well as expanding across other primary industry sectors. It is in this way that we can replicate the framework and work towards consistent metrics across the whole Australian agri-food industry. Our on-farm experimentation project is another great example. It's a partnership between Food Agility, the Western Australian Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development, Curtin University and Grower Group Alliance. Together, we are building a suite of analytical tools that farmers can use to run a whole range of on-farm experiments so they can better understand and manage their production systems. It is empowering hundreds of grain farmers to unlock the value of their data and become scientists in their own field. But all of this experimentation on farm needs scientific infrastructure behind it to drive ongoing technological innovation, to share and validate knowledge, and to train and build capability in our future workforces. I like to think of our smart farms as our innovation base stations that are advancing new knowledge, pushing the boundaries of the possible, educating the scientific workforce and connecting with science, connecting science with practice on the ground. In May this year, Food Agility announced that it would build Australia's first hands-free farm, our autonomous farm at, at Wagga Wagga in New South Wales in collaboration with Charles Sturt University. The Global Digital Farm is a 1600 hectare commercial mixed farming enterprise that will be a centre of research, innovation, education and community outreach. The first phase of its development focuses on soil and water. We're developing a whole of farm digital carbon and biodiversity inventory. We're looking at building a live soil moisture sensor network. We'll have instrumented water points. We have cattle tag readers and we'll have weather stations collecting data and supporting other instrumented technology. Work is also underway, planning the base telecommunications and data infrastructure. We have a real challenge with connectivity problems in Australia, but we're also looking at developing an industry training centre and demonstrators of automated technology. So farmers and producers can actually see things in action. What's so great about the Global Digital Farm and the network of smart farms is that they are bringing together scientists, farmers, agri-food workers and technologists into the one place. Taking stock, we have farmers and producers experimenting on farm and we have scientific infrastructure to support them. But we all know that a significant barrier still exists. It's mentioned in just about every report on digital adoption and data in agriculture. We have technology, we have trade and traceability. The missing factor is trust. A recent report published by our Food Agility, the Australian Farm Institute and Meat and Livestock Australia identified four barriers to building trust in agricultural value chains. Our current business models encourage organisations to guard and protect their data. We're not very good at always explaining what the value proposition of new technology might be. We know that digital readiness and competence is varied across our sectors. And we also know that some problems can only be addressed systemically. They can't all be answered on individual farms. 
One way that we're looking at building trust is through voluntary codes. Australia has followed countries like the United States, the EU and New Zealand in implementing a farm data code. It was developed by our National Farmers Federation. Andrea Koch, who appears in this picture, is an ag tech specialist and she led the working group to develop the code. This farm data code is the benchmark by which farmers can assess the policies and contracts presented to them by their service providers. Food Agility has also published a best, data, a best practice data policy. It's a framework for managing data in research to encourage data sharing, propel innovation, and protect the interests of those who generate the data, in many cases, the farmers and producers. The policy sets out the rights and responsibilities of all parties and includes a series of case studies to explain complex scenarios. The next evolution of this collaborative process is to incorporate the objectives of both the farm data code and the best practice data policy into a template data sharing agreement that can be used across all industry sectors. This has been developed by Food Agility in collaboration with the National Farmers Federation, but also with some very strong legal advice behind it. The agreement will aim to balance the rights of all contracted parties, build trust and encourage data sharing. So our farmers and producers are becoming the lead experimenters and innovators, much as they have always been. Science infrastructure is more aligned and supportive. We're building trust to share data in a way that propels innovation. We must always assure consumers and customers that the food we produce is safe to eat. Otherwise, there will be no markets or confidence. That is, no trust. If I come now to regulators, regulators have always grappled with the balance between achieving safe food outcomes with minimising the costs of intervention, both to the regulator and to industry. The challenge of regulating a farm on Mars brings this into stark relief. RegTech, a contemporary term, is very advanced in some industries. We just have to look to the finance sectors. But in agri-food, it's relatively immature. One of the best examples of RegTech in Australia and in Australian agri-food is the program being developed by Dairy Food Safety Victoria. This online system was developed directly with dairy manufacturers and focuses on establishing a food safety culture and reducing food safety risk through business behavioural change. It combines food safety performance and culture data to support continuous improvement. In this way, dairy businesses and their staff become the owners of the control measures and food safety risk management, rather than the safety hazard themselves. The Dairy Food Safety Victoria portal is both a tool for manufacturers and the regulator. Companies make regular data submissions and analyses through the portal and can access guidance materials to build a better safety culture. From the regulator's perspective, the system supports more targeted regulatory interactions, with audits moving from standard checklists to discussions on particular issues identified as food safety risks. We expect that over time, the system will lead to fewer but better targeted audits. This should be a move towards improved food safety risk control and management by businesses away from the traditional compliance retrospective auditing tool. The key point here is that achieving regulatory requirements in food safety will be integrated into every business and the result that regulation will be seen as an investment rather than it's currently views, viewed as a burden and cost. Regulation will no longer be the bit to, left to consider at the end but be part of an integral part of continuous improvement and commitment to consumer food safety. The Dairy RegTech system also focuses on people first, technology second, recognising that while technology is an enabler, it is the behaviour of people that counts for most when it comes to safety. 
And this brings me to the, my conclusion. You'll note that my presentation today didn't feature data technology, digital science, research, modeling, or AI. It featured people. Catherine Marriott, a scientist. Professor David Lamb, also a scientist. Catherine Marriott, a beef farmer and scientist. Andrea Koch, an ag tech expert. And Renee Dedenka, CEO of one of our region's biggest dairy companies. Whether we are talking about practice change on farm, training our future workforce, building trust, or inspiring a food safety culture, data and technology are enablers. They are not objectives in themselves. And we must never lose sight that the end game is for consumers to have enough food that is safe, for producers and agribusiness workers to prosper. And we can do all of this in a healthy environment that sustains a growing population. That is a tall order for us here on Earth, but it is a far sight easier than doing it on Mars. Finally, I'd like to thank the fabulous Food Agility CRC and Dairy Food Safety Victoria teams for preparing this presentation for me to you today. Please visit our websites to learn about the full extent of our exciting Australian agenda. And thank you for your time today.